was is not just was Satan is a very um, smart uh, created angel uh, that's that uh, no doubt was created to uh, give glory to God and was not created to be uh, ignorant. He was created to be very knowledgeable. But when he chose to uh, become equal to God is when things started to fall apart. So let us always be students of God's word to God and let us never become so high and lifted up that we become vengeful and attacking and um, losing the idea of knowledge. Knowledge is not for us to know everything. Knowledge is for us to be able to uh, reach other people with the gospel and to be an encouragement to others. God gave us the opportunity to learn so that we can be a blessing to others, not that we can be divisive and a hindrance to the work of God. So be very careful. Uh, study, study, study. I love to learn, and I encourage you to learn. But also understand that, um, you know, if you get to a point where you're learning without God being your authority, that's a problem can creep in. Uh, let's continue. So we go to the number two, and it says here, uh, number two, David Livingston overcame fear and refused to let failure get the best of him. He overcame fear and refused to let failure get the best of him. Proverbs 24, 16, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Every one of you are going to have hard times in your life. And if you haven't yet, you will, I promise. But the Bible says that we, uh, with God's help and God's grace, have the ability to rise up again. If you're a just man, if you don't rise up again, then you need to ask yourself, what is it that I'm lacking? Because the Bible promises that just men get back up. And uh, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It just means that a just man relies on God. Isaiah 41, 10, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand. Right hand. We see here, once hey, David lived Arrived in London, he began to work hands. Uh, hold on one second. Let me get somebody. Okay, everybody's muted. All right, let me go back to it. Okay. Uh, once David Livingston arrived in London, he began to work hands-on with live patients performing surgeries. This gave him additional practice for when he would arrive in China. Not only was the probationary period for medical purposes, but it was also for ministry purposes. David Livingston continued working on his Greek and Hebrew, uh, as well as sermon preparation and sermon delivery. He enjoyed the sermon preparation, and he was given an opportunity to prove himself at a church service. To his surprise, young David Livingston uh, saw on the front row of the congregation his teacher, which caused him to have stage fright and actually had him run out of the church. David Livingston, he didn't even begin to preach. He just ran in fear. Due to this debacle, the professor recommended to the London Missionary Society that David Livingston should fail his course. But God was gracious to David and gave him an additional probation time to retry which proved to be successful. And we talked about this last week, but please don't let failure determine you. We're in a society today where we believe that if you are not successful the first time, then God is, uh, then God is a failure. God looks bad. We look bad. And that's not how God measures success. God does not measure your success in time frames of short uh, span. He measures success by faithfulness. Not by a year or two years or five years of you being a pastor, but by your whole life. Uh, we remember the verse, the Bible says that uh, God says, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, that deals with the, the entire uh, faithfulness of a man. So don't get discouraged, please. So many people, they get discouraged over one instance in their life. Their breakfast fell over. 
And they said, oh, I'm a failure. God cannot use me. And I might as well give up from the ministry. Or, and it's not always said so, but sometimes it's a serious thing. I have a man in my church rise up and he's trying to hurt the church and he's trying to hurt the work. And I'm just going to quit. Please do, do not quit. God will count your success based on how faithful you are. Um, a man's a man needs to be faithful for more than one reason. Number one, for God. Uh, God counts us as faithful if we remain faithful, not according to our ups and downs. Number two, our children. Our children. If you don't remain faithful, why do you expect your children to remain faithful? If you can't, if you get upset and you you quit the ministry, how do you expect your children to continue in the ministry? My son, he's uh, eight years old and he looks at me. He sees me as a as a father figure, obviously, and as a man. And if I can't act like a man, then how is he going to act like a man? He has to learn by watching. And so let us be faithful because there's other people watching us and also watching us. And we don't want to let them down. Take a week off and maybe uh, go on. Bad, and that's fine. God, because God has been suffering. Christ had to suffer, then why do we get to live in? And, uh, not, that makes sense. Uh, so just don't quit. David Livingston never quit it, even when he could have because he failed the class. Number three, David Livingston did not just go soul winning, he was a soul winner. Big difference. Big difference. My desire when I go all around the world. Is not to just tell people about Jesus. My desire is to be a picture of Jesus. Jesus went about doing good. Jesus went about pointing people to the to heaven and to telling them uh, of the the way, the truth, the life, which was through Him. And uh, may it always be in each one of our lives to not just go soul winning, but to be that soul winner, be that answer to the Hindu that, that's trying to decide if he wants to be Christian or not. I think sometimes we have the opportunity to convince someone about the Savior, and we are very close, but then we act ungodly, and it discourages the individual from coming to know Christ as a Savior. So let us not just go so winning, let's be a soul winner. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's hard to preach the gospel if we're not living the gospel. It's hard to preach and point people to heaven when we look like we're headed to hell. It's hard to uh, point people to Jesus when it looks like we're serving Satan. So not only do we preach, we also should live it. Philippians 2, 14 through 16, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Uh, the, uh, the Christian, especially the minister, should never be one that is given or that is thought to be one that disputes and causes problems. Every person in the world should be able to say this about the Bible says we're supposed to look at the next verse that ye may be blameless. The Bible says that as a minister of righteousness, one thing that the world, every person in the world should be able to say about a minister is that he's not one given to murmuring and gossip and disputing and trying to cause problems, but rather he's one that's always trying to heal. We're supposed to be the the healer. We're supposed to be the one that's pointing people to the great physician, not one that's hurting them and uh, and doing the opposite. The Bible says we're supposed to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Let me stop with that verse for a second. There's a lot of there's a lot of problems in today's society, but the problems can change with us. Uh, we shouldn't focus on the problems. There's a lot of Christians that are missionaries and pastors, and they're doing wicked things and doing things they shouldn't be doing, and they're hurting the cause of Christ. They're hurting the the unsaved's idea of God. That's why the Bible says one of the Ten Commandments is, "Thou shalt not take." The name of the Lord thy God in vain. That word there means to do not pretend that you are one of God's chosen ministers and then walk around living like the devil. 
because that hurts the name of God. So many Christians, I mean, so many people in America today do not want to become Christians because the people that are supposed to be following Christ look nothing like Christ. And again, we are not supposed to focus on that. We can't change people, but we can be the better person. And we can begin to change the course of Christianity by living the way we should live. You just understand it never pays to sin. It never pays. Be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So many people think, oh, I can get by with this. And then what happens is their children get destroyed. Their country gets destroyed. There was a recent situation that took place here in America with a minister that did something they should not have done. And now all over the internet, there are people walking and talking, saying that, oh, look, see, I don't want to be a Christian because Christians are wicked people. Well, that's not all Christians, but it is some Christians. And unfortunately, it's some of the Christians that are in leadership positions. So us as leaders should live that religious life that is not without Christ. We're not supposed to go and preach a sermon on Sunday and then leave that sermon there and the rest of the week do what we want. We're supposed to be yielded and completely surrendered to the will of God. And if that means that we uh, we have to crucify the flesh, then we should crucify the flesh. But please understand, what you do in your life today will affect the generations to come if God does not come back. If God does not come back within the next generation, what you do in your life will affect the next generation and how they see Christianity. You know, in today's society, pastors sometimes have this idea in the world that, oh, they have their hypocrites. But, you know, a lot of times missionaries don't have that. They don't have that mindset because the average person thinks of a missionary as a servant, as one that gives their life and gives all. Well, why is that? That's because that picture has not been distorted yet. Now, I think sometimes the wicked distorts pictures uh, more than what they are. <laughs> but I think also sometimes the Christians distort our own picture because we're not living like Christ. It's like what Muhammad Gandhi said. Muhammad Gandhi, when he was asked, why don't you become a Christian? You look like a very sincere man, a very passionate man. Why don't you take on the name of Christianity? And Muhammad Gandhi said, oh, I love Christ. I just don't like the Christians because the Christians are nothing like Christ. Well, if the Christians do not become like Christ, then people are not going to become Christians because they want a, a people all around the world are looking for hope. They're looking for change. They're looking for a better life. And that better life comes through Christ, but it also comes through a yieldedness of Christ. So let's always be committed to that, living that holy, right life. Blameless, the Bible says, without, uh, uh, without any type of accusation, holding forth the word of life that we can re rejoice in the day of Christ. Let's look at the story part of uh, David Livingston while traveling by ship to Port Elizabeth. David Livingston, as well as everyone on the boat, hazarded death to try and reach the southern tip of Africa. Uh, during a storm, the ship was majorly damaged and could no longer be steered. This lack of control drifted the ship westward to Brazil. So that's a big, that's a big drift. They went from Africa all the way to South America. Uh, however, it was in Brazil that the ship would take a few weeks to be repaired. This opportunity allowed David Livingston to distribute Bibles and tracts to everyone he could meet. He knew that although God had called him to Africa, he was supposed to be a soul winner, a messenger of the gospel anywhere. The Lord placed his feet, and obviously God sent him there because there, was, there had to be somebody that wanted to hear the gospel, and God knew that Livingston would get the gospel out. When the ship was repaired and headed course to Port Elizabeth, once again, the ship had to, for, had to stop for supplies and repairs in Cape Town. It was during this time in, in his life that David would begin to notice that not every missionary had the same commitment and determination as he did. The missionary couple that agreed to go with him was very negative and critical of everything because of their remembrances of the better days. This toxic mentality disgusted David and made him wish that the couple would recognize the opportunities rather than the problems. Finally, after refilling the ship, David Livingston was headed towards his final destination. 
And so we see there, don't just go soul winning. Don't just tell people about Jesus, but be a soul winner. Be a picture of Jesus. Let's look at the next one. Number four, David Livingston used medicine. He used medicine to point to the great physician. Jeremiah 51, 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her? Take balm for her pain. If so, be, she may be healed. Uh, Matthew 9, 12, but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. Um, we see the first village David and Robert would come across was the Bechuana people. These people had been attacked often by the Greekas, and David knew time was important for the Bechuana tribe before they would become mean and hostile towards outsiders and foreigners. After the two, David and Robert, were welcomed into the village, the chief and other important leaders became interested in the supplies that the missionaries had brought with them. The greatest supplies of interest happened to be the medicine. The Bechuanas were familiar with the witch doctor. And they could relate medicine with the spiritual realm, the spiritual world. This allowed David the opportunity to set up a medical tent with ailments as well as share the gospel. And day after day, the number of people grew for medical attention. Day after day, the number of people willing to listen to a clear presentation of the gospel grew as well. Robert was so glad to see all the opportunities to share the gospel, but it wasn't long before David Livingston believed it was time to move further in inland to reach additional tribes. David Livingston could sense the hesitation with Robert. He was starting to see how the majority of missionaries were complacent with staying in one area to reach people with the gospel. But David Livingston would not be satisfied until he could reach every village with at least one opportunity to hear a clear gospel message. Due to the strength of leadership with David Livingston, both Robert and David continued northward for unreached villages. And so even still today, God uses the opportunity for ministries to give the gospel out. If you have a ministry at your church or in your village for feeding the poor, don't give up on that. But let me encourage you. Many people will feed the poor physically, but they neglect to feed the poor spiritually. You know, the Bible says, listen to this verse. God's people, nor his seed. So if the Bible says God's children never have to worry about food because the heavenly father will take care of his children. Now, why are there so many poor people in the world? I think two reasons. Number one, I think of them is are not saved. And, and if they're not, then they're not going to be taken care of because they're not the of God. That's why it's all our responsibility to take care of the poor so that we can show the poor that are unsaved that we, the Christians, have a good heavenly father. Their father is the devil. Their father could care less about feeding him. Quite honestly, their father, the devil, wants to destroy them. They, he wants, as a roaring lion, to consume them. But our desire is to feed them so that we can point them to the Savior. I think that's not all of them. I think some are Christians. I'm not saying every person that begs is unsaved. I think the second group of people are Christians that are disobedient towards their father. My children, I have two, are Brooklyn and Titus. And both of them, many times I will prepare a meal and I will set it at the table and I will tell them to eat the meal for breakfast or for dinner. But they will be too busy doing what they want to do rather than obey their father. And so they will go and grab their toys and play with their toys and they won't eat properly. Well, guess what happens? Now breakfast is over and it's time to move on with life. And what do the children do? They will say, oh, I'm so very hungry. Oh, I'm begging for food. Please give me food. I need food. Now, did I not give them food? Of course I did. But they were too busy disobeying rather than obeying my command. I commanded them to eat breakfast at the time we had prepared. So I believe there are a few that God has as they are saved, and God wants to feed them, but they're too busy disobeying God and living a life of rebellion. Uh, many times in my country, in the U.S., we will go to the homeless. 
and we'll bring food and try to feed them. And I was talking to some of the homeless there and there's a shelter with very nice air condition and nice rooms and they can eat three meals a day. Very, very good environment for the homeless. And I was asking some of the homeless, why do these people over here, why do they not get to live in the house for the homeless? And the, the, the people were telling me they don't get to live there because they have a curfew. And what that means is at 9 p.m., they have to be back at the place and be prepared to take rest because it's nighttime. But these people do not want to obey rules. They do not want to listen to people. And so as they have a bed and a room that is air conditioned and food, these individuals are rebellious and disobedient. And therefore, they have no place to sleep. They have no place to eat. But they do not mind because they are rebellious. And so what I'm saying is not everybody that is homeless or begging for food is necessarily um, unsaved. That doesn't mean they're all unsaved. I think sometimes it's because they, what does the Bible say? And that does not work, should not eat. So sometimes God could provide the opportunity here. My son, I want you to go work and take care of your livelihood, but they don't want to work. So disobedience still causes sin. And sin still causes death. But that's not everyone. There's many, and as we saw here, the Bechuana tribe, it was a group of people that did not know our God, and they were worshiping fake gods, and they were begging for help, medicine. They needed help because their bodies were very sick. And so I'm encouraging you as ministers that you will go and use things of this world to point people to the Savior. Feed the homeless, feed the hungry. Uh, if you have the ability to bring medicine and to bring uh, medical professionals to people that are in need, take it to them. But do not forget that these are tools that point people to the Savior. Many times we will get so focused on feeding the hungry that we forget to feed them spiritually. You know, hunger lasts for just a moment. You give them a piece of food and the hunger goes away. But if they do not receive salvation, if they do not receive the gospel, then they will hunger the rest of their life when they die. And so let's not forget the spiritual food, the spiritual need. Many in the world today are hungering for Christ. And let us always remember that this is not all that we're supposed to do. We're also supposed to feed them spiritually. But guess what? Because David Livingston fed them, uh, uh, took care of their body according to medicine, that he was also able to give the gospel. And so many, so many people were able to listen and were willing to listen because the Bible says that a gift makes room. If you have somebody you've never met and you go and give them a gift, guess what? It allows you opportunities to begin to reach into the life of that, that person. So let's use these ministry we see not just in David Lewis's life, but also in the Bible, we see that God Himself, Jesus, would feed the five thousand and let you do that to get the gospel out. Now let's continue on with the next point we see here. Uh, number five, they, uh, David Livingston was careful to give spiritual medicine along with the physical. Psalms one forty seven three, he healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up their wounds. And that's obviously talking about our Savior. He is the one that can fix the spiritual heart problems. Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary. Don't quit when you're doing well. For in due season we shall reap if we don't faint, if we faint not. In each of every situation, the hardest thing to telling the villagers while leaving David Livingston, the hardest thing was that he would be back. So many people wanted hope. Many believed that the villages only wanted physical hope. But David Livingston would give countless times of men and women wanting medicine. And this is what they would say. They would say, hey, sir, Livingston, I want medicine to change my heart. Yes, they wanted their arms fixed. And yes, they wanted to fix their broken bones. But they also wanted their hearts fixed. And guess what? In response to this need, David Livingston would always point to the Bible and he would share that the gospel is the only medicine that can truly fix the heart. 
By this time, David Livingston had already charted almost all of the known African world. What was left north was called the Kalahari Desert, and no one had traveled truly this area enough to put even a map of anything more than just the word Kalahari Desert. David Livingston decided he would be the man to change this. While in the Bamangwato village, David Livingston began to make plans for a trip further north to visit the Baka tribe. The chief in Babangwato discouraged Livingston from going to what he called this murderous tribe. But Devin Livingston was not scared in his calling. He knew that someone <clears throat> had to share the gospel with these people. And stubborn enough David Livingston was, he must be the man. And so, again, as we talk, let's not let medicine be only for the physical body, but let it, let's reach them with uh, the spiritual medicine of the gospel. Number six. David Livingston stayed faithful to the call of God on his life, and it was evident, not just evident to him, but evident to others. Others knew that David Livingston was being used by God. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. God says that we should protect our callings and make it sure, make the world see what we truly were called to do. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Psalms 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he, the man, delighteth in his way. As David Livingston began to pray that God would fund the opportunity to explore further north for the gospel and to protect these villages from enslavement, the Lord answered his prayer. A wealthy hunter, explorer, heard of David Livingston's interest to travel further inward and not only had he interest as well but was willing to allow david livingston to travel along without cost he didn't have to pay for anything this answer to prayer allowed livingston to find lake nagami and the zuga river for future mission plants this excursion proved to be beneficial for the opening up of africa for future gospel possibilities but many in the mission board did not see it the same way many people thought that david livingston was not very faithful to missions and he was too concerned with exploring rather than giving the gospel. But only prayer, time, and faith would continue to advance the calling in David Livingston's life. And again, don't get discouraged by what people say, because people can only look at your life in a short time frame. Let God be true and every man a liar. As David Livingston became more convicted of his calling, which was to reach all of Africa, God, by God, he realized that he was not a missionary given over to one location in the world, but rather a missionary that would break ground for others to come after him. He became resolute, determined in his purpose to plant the seed of the gospel for the very first time in many villages that had never heard and let someone after him come and pick the fruit for the Lord's harvest. So if God has called you to do something special, in a way that may not be normal in today's society, but it is biblical, then who cares what people think? Because when it's all said and done, God is the one that you're supposed to be pleasing, and God is the one that you're supposed to be uh, remaining faithful to. So let's remain faithful in our callings so that when our life's work is ended, then we can be able to say truly this work that you did in God. Let's look at the next point. We see that, um, oh, hold on. okay, number seven, David Livingston's strong faith showed a difference in his religion. Uh, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Uh, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The news of the murderous tribe, remember the one tribe said to not go to the other one because they were a bunch of murderers. Uh, this, this news was everywhere in Africa. The Baka tribe had killed a foreign trade traitor so not just his own people or a, an, an indian african person uh, but also a foreigner and how he killed him was supposedly by poisoning the water and this was a very scary predicament to those that knew david livingston's intent 
However, David was not worried. He traveled to the tribe and showed his trust in the tribe by asking for water from the tribe that poisoned the last person so that he could prepare some meal for food. With this attitude of complete faith, the village quickly received David Livingston and welcomed him as a friend. Once again, the Lord allowed David Livingston to be used to spread the gospel to an unreached people group that was feared by everyone. Village after village wondered why David Livingston had no interest in trade or in hunting or in conquest. They were mesmerized by the gospel that each tribe had never heard of. Many of the individuals even questioned why David Livingston was the first one to reach their village in all of these years if this was truly such great news. Although David Livingston could not answer the question for why all the other Christians before him were not as zealous in trying to reach this tribe, he did make it a purpose in his life to reach everyone with the news before he dies. And so let's remain faithful. And uh, it reminds me, you know, a lot of times God is able to show his power through, um, through our faith, through our strength. Uh, not sh the Bible, what are we scared of? You know, in America, there's people on both sides. And, and I'm not interested in, in hearing your side, whether you're for the vaccine or you're against the vaccine of the COVID vaccine. Because listen, many on both sides are living fear. Many don't want to take the vaccine because they're scared the vaccine's going to kill them. Then many want to take the vaccine because they're scared COVID will kill them. But can I tell you, if you're saved, you can't die. God will protect you. You are his child. There's no such thing as death to a Christian because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But if you're saved today, Jesus already paid for your sin on the cross. He already died for you. So as a Christian, we cannot die. There's only a thing called going home. And so let's be strong for the Lord. I was reading a, a missionary story to my son and my daughter last night. It was a young boy. He was 12 years old. He was in a very rich castle up in Germany. And this 12-year-old boy, every morning he would pray and read his Bible while he ate his breakfast. And this group of military soldiers from Sweden broke in, I'm sorry, Switzerland, broke into the castle and they were going to take everything out of the castle. And as they bust the door open, they saw this young boy, 12 years old, a little boy, and he's sitting there eating and reading his Bible, and he would pray to God. And this 12-year-old boy, as the door bust open, he looked at the soldiers, and rather than be scared, he looked at them, and then he put his head back down and began to pray. And you know what happened? The soldiers left the house, and as the grandmother came back in and asked the young boy, are you okay, are you okay? The boy said, of course I'm okay. I've been spending time with God. How could I not be okay? And the grandmother said, well, you know what the soldier said as they ran away from the house? And the boy said, what did they say? And the mother and the grandma said, the soldiers ran from the house and said, we can't steal anything from this castle. God owns everything in here. And God would curse us. And so we, I think, a lot of times do not have the ability to change the lives of the people because the God we serve that is real doesn't look real because we're so scared of what's going to happen to our lives rather than rely on God. God is the one that will take care of it. Now, if you're not living the right kind of life, if you're living in sin and God has the opportunity to judge you, well, then that may be why you're so scared. But if you're living the way you're supposed to for God, then what do you have to be afraid of? We should not be in fear. It's really, honestly, the times when we're strong with the Lord is when people get fearful and want to receive the Lord as their Savior. So let's be strong during times of fear, and let's take a stand for Christ so that others can see Christ, be able to see that our God is the true God and the strong God. Uh, number eight, the decisions and choices missionaries make are tough, and they're very real. Uh, Colossians 4, 3, without pray, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. 2 Corinthians 1, 11, ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. 
And here's a story just kind of to show you how hard his life was at times after a letter from Mary Livingston's mom about her concern that David was being reckless with Mary and the children by going to these villages and all these illnesses. David began to reevaluate the wisdom behind the whole family traveling the unknown areas. With much prayer, David Livingston believed that it was God's will for him personally to have his wife and children go back to Scotland and for David Livingston to visit Scotland every two years. Mary Livingston, his wife, was scared of Scotland because she actually was born in Africa as a missionary child and preferred to stay in the jungles of Africa with her husband. But David Livingston's mind was made up and the family traveled to Scotland to live with David's family. David Livingston knew it was important for him to travel back, having promised to visit his family in Scotland after two years. The two content continental journeys pushed the timeline from two years to four and a half years. He could only imagine how grown up everyone was if nothing had happened to any of the children or even his wife. When David Livingston arrived in Scotland, his wife told David how uncomfortable she was living by herself in Scotland. She grew up in Africa, and her heart was in Africa. She was also created to be the helpmeet of David as his wife, and she wished to die by his side. As noted in this poem that was referenced in the book, The Christian Heroes, Then and Now series, titled David Livingston, this is what she wrote as a poem to her husband. Uh, she said, you'll never part me, darling. There's a promise in your eye. I may tend you while I'm living. You will watch me when I die. And if death but kindly lead me to the blessed home on high, what a hundred thousand welcomes will await you in the sky. And so there we see this uh, dear lady, wife of, of Livingston say, I don't want to, I don't want to stay in Scotland. If I need to die, look, that, that we've changed as Christians. You know, Christians back in the old days, they weren't afraid to die because they knew where they were going. Do you believe heaven is real? Because if you believe heaven is real, then what are you so scared of? Let's live that life of strength and let's live that life of not being afraid because that's what's going to allow people to see, whoa, God's real. So, so many people, you know why so many people are afraid of COVID? They're afraid of COVID because they don't have hope. They're not saved. If they die, where are they going to go? That they're so confused and they're lost and they're wanting help and hope. So let's not be the same people of fear, but let's be the people now. Let's be wise, let's eat right, let's exercise, let's, like, let's take care of our bodies. But let's not live a, a life of fear like the unsaved. Live a, a fear of a life of power and of love. And, and of, so that, that people can come and ask them, I have a hope. She was not interested in Scotland. If she died, it's okay. If she had, and heaven's beautiful in this earth. So that's it for today. And so, again, I won't be here next week. So next week, try to get all the rest of those little paragraphs finished, as well as other assignments. And uh, I will see you the following week. And uh, thank you again for being so faithful and patient with us as we were trying to get this up and going. I think it was uh, maybe the first time it was because of an issue, but after, I think it was more mine because I logged in real quick on my phone and it worked on my phone, so I had to figure out how to get back on my computer. So thank you for bearing uh, for me and be patient. And again, it's always a blessing to see you all. You're always in my prayers. I'm thankful for you serving in a country that is not easy to serve in for the gospel. And as I, uh, as I said in times past, keep it up. Uh, you have somebody that is truly thankful for your faithfulness. And uh, we will see you next uh, two weeks from now. All right. Take care. Okay.